Um, I want to begin my extremely brief remarks by thanking Richard Robb once again for organizing this conference. <clears throat> I meant to say, for conceiving this conference, for organizing this conference, and doing everything else about this conference. <laughs> the artist uh, who did the artwork that has excited so much conversation <laughs> is uh, Vicky uh, Kutsami, uh, who did the uh, mural uh, in the uh, in the offices of Richard Robb in Midtown. So next time you're down in around Midtown and you want to see that mural, you can uh, drop in on uh, Richard. <clears throat> I think this is a slightly modified version of the original um, mural. Um, <clears throat> I'm so grateful to Karen Lee and Francesca Mari for uh, their tireless efforts to make this conference uh, happen and, 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 and make it work. If, if, are you here? Would you please stand up? <laughs> they are truly incredible and I'm, I'm just, so blessed to have these talented and, and responsible and dedicated people helping me in, in my life, in my life. Uh, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> it's my pleasure to introduce John Kay as the dinner speaker tonight. This is our last night, if you are counting, and, and <laughs> Um, we um, are ending ending in a um, suitable fashion. Uh, John Kay, um, from what little I know about his youth, he was a, uh, a child actor. That is itself a story. <laughs> I have no idea what happens between them and when he becomes a professor of finance somewhere in Britain. <laughs> and then he becomes uh, the founding director of the um, Said um, School of Business in Oxford. And then, rather quickly after that, he settles down in uh, wherever, whether it's Cotswold or Oxfordshire or London or wherever, I'm not exactly clear. He settles down to um, independent, independent private pursuits. And we all know him as the brilliant and profound writer in the Financial Times op-ed page every week, every Wednesday, um, uh, with amazing uh, regularity. So it's, it's a tremendous pleasure uh, to um, introduce John to you and to welcome you uh, and welcome him to uh, to uh, to uh, all of you and to uh, greet him on the occasion of his after dinner speech. John. Thank you, Ned, and thank you, Ned and Richard, for. Uh, giving us this conference, and thank you, Ned, for that introduction. I'll fill in at least a few of the gaps uh, in the course of what I have to say this evening. When I came out of the hotel this morning, as is the way in American hotels, I had to run the gauntlet of people saying, how are you this morning? <laughs> and uh, so on. And I gave the expected answers. I'm good. It's great. I've never been better. <laughs> and I have to say, I find all this quite difficult because I'm a Scot. 
And in Scotland, if you stay in a hotel or perhaps a boarding house, it's unlikely that you will be asked, how are you today? <laughs> uh, right, you will be lucky if you get more than there's a Scottish kind of flick of the head <laughs> that acknowledges the existence of another person but doesn't go beyond that. But if they did ask you how you were today, if you were feeling really joyous, you might say something like, well, it's not too bad. <laughs> In Scotland, uh, if you tell your doctor you are very well, he will look at you and say, hmm, I thought there was something wrong, <laughs> and write out a prescription for Valium. <laughs> Now, we have these problems, although both Scots and Americans speak versions of English. <laughs> and nevertheless, these nuances in the English language are partly matters of expression. That is, we use words differently in different parts of the Anglophone world. And they're partly also differences in underlying culture and social attitudes. That is, Americans are naturally optimistic and enthusiastic, and Scots are naturally gloomy and uh, relatively pessimistic. <laughs> In Scotland, if you're asked, how are you today, it's perfectly admissible to say, terrible. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you will not be put on suicide watch. <laughs> it probably means no more than that it's raining today. <laughs> and since it often is raining in Scotland, <laughs> that's a large part of the reason why I've, I've chosen to live in France rather than in <laughs> Scotland. <laughs> Those of you who've been to France will have discovered the it always infuriates Americans in France that the French have this unfortunate habit of speaking French. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, translation adds to the difficulty people have in understanding each other. I have a friend whose father is a rather straight-laced English peer, a member of the House of Lords in, in Britain. And he's also, uh, among other things, chairman of the Pedestrians Association, an organization which campaigns against crack paving stones and other major ills of the world of that kind. And my friend described to me a letter which his father had received, I think, from the Far East, which began, Honored sir, you are renowned as England's greatest street walker. <laughs> and uh, went on from there. So that even if we can translate words or use words in different parts of the same uh, empire of people speaking a language, they have different meanings and different nuances. And that's why although the work of people like Engelhardt on the World Value Survey and so on, which we, in which the same questions are asked across a variety of countries. I think these are very interesting pieces of work that raise a lot of questions, but I don't think we should do more than regarding them as raising a lot of questions. And before taking the answers too seriously, we should ask ourselves whether we're really sure that happiness as whatever it may be in Danish means in Danish quite the same thing that the word happiness means in parts of the English-speaking world. Now, as I say, I have a house in France and spend quite a lot of time there. And when I told Ned that, uh, he, didn't, he didn't seem to have taken that bit of information in, but I have told Ned that. Uh, when I told Ned that, he didn't say, as I would have expected him to say, so why on earth are you living in a hellhole like that? <laughs> he said the kind of thing that almost everyone, including several people I've talked to over the last two days, say when I say I live in France. 
and they say, that must be really nice. The French have a great lifestyle, don't they? And when people are talking about the French lifestyle, they're typically talking about a pretty standard range of things. They're talking about the fact that Paris is a, uh, probably the most beautiful city in the world that is still actually a functioning metropolis. They're talking about the, the joy of going to street markets that are groaning with fruit and vegetables of the first quality. They're talking about sidewalk cafes where you can still, I believe, find Jean-Paul Sartre smoking galois <laughs> uh, and, uh, and uh, waiting for um, uh, uh, various uh, his colleagues. Uh, or you can go and sun yourself on Saint-Tropez with Brigitte Bardot. They're talking about little restaurants where chef patrons serve excellent food at low prices. There are several of these restaurants round about uh, my house in the south of France. I'm afraid they've got into the business of English translation too. Google Translator does wonders for uh, <laughs> their menus. Not quite wonders, in fact. There's uh, a local one that uh, translated poulet sauté au marjolain as the chicken jumped in the marjoram. <laughs> and uh, lapin du chef as the chef's rabbit. <laughs> and it's quite difficult to explain why although the chef's rabbit is indeed an accurate translation of <laughs> lapin du chef, it doesn't give quite the impression in English that it does in France. They also offered another, as another delicacy pavement of ox. Anyway, I've helped them with the idiom of their English translations. But for economists, there's an acid test, which we call revealed preference. And that goes rather in France's favor, despite some things that are said about France in, on this side of the Atlantic. If you ask, what is the country in the world that attracts most international tourists? The answer is France, by a considerable margin. If you look at the percentage of residents who were born outside the country, France is now slightly behind the United States, a country where the proportion of immigrants in that sense has risen rather rapidly in the last 20 years for reasons I think you're all familiar with. And the proportion of uh, residents who were not born in the country is actually twice the UK level in France. So that uh, I have a prejudice in favor of France that is rather well reflected in my revealed preference, which is to live there. Now, I agree very much with the emphasis which, with which Ned began this conference and which has been a theme throughout it, that uh, self-realization is an important part of the key to the good life. But I'm rather surprised that France might be regarded as failing in self-realization, especially on this side of the Atlantic. Because actually, the idea that self-realization is best achieved in France has been a theme of, French, of American literature for 100 years or more, from, at the one end, uh, Edith Wharton and Henry James through to uh, Richard Yates more recently. And in the meantime, people like Hemingway and Scott Fitzgerald actually went so far as to attempt to achieve that kind of self-realization. I've noticed that uh, the latest Woody Allen film, as a matter of fact, turns out to be on the theme of the American dream of realizing their full potential by going to France in order to do it. And I think it's quite hard to say that the country of Matisse and Braque and Rodin, the country which attracted Picasso and others to go and live there, is a country that is, limits people in their capacity for self-realization. But what is plainly true of 
all the people I've just said, is that the self-realization they went to France to achieve, or did achieve in France, was clearly not self-realization in the economic sphere. It was not Thomas Edison or Henry Ford or Steve Jobs who had the aspiration of achieving self-realization by going to France. If Steve Jobs had been in France or gone to France, I've no doubt he would still be at the Marie trying to get permission to get a permit to assemble <laughs> computers in his garage. I expect also that Bill Gates would not have been allowed to write software because having dropped out of college, he didn't have the appropriate certificates to uh, make that possible. If your route to self-realization is trading derivatives, France is probably not the place to do it, although there are a lot of young French boys and girls trading derivatives. You will find them in France and New York, and they're well-received in, in, in London and New York, and they're well-received in London and New York because French math education is actually a good deal better than math education in either Britain or the United States. Uh, but is trading derivatives a genuine route to self-realization? Uh, I'm pretty confident that when Aristotle was writing somewhat unfavorably about merchants, uh, collateralized debt obligations were precisely what Aristotle was thinking about at the time. Bear Stearns was the organization that made nothing but money, and in the end, Bear Stearns turned out not even to make that. <laughs> Self-realization in business is, in fact, different from making money, and that's one of the things that several speakers have emphasized in the course of the last day and a half. Self-realization in business <laughs> is about producing products that are wanted and enduring businesses and creating enduring businesses rather than making money. And that is what people like Henry Ford or Steve Jobs or Bill Gates have done. And it's perfectly clear that if you review the careers of all of these people, that it was building businesses in that sense that was the key to their self-realization. What I've been trying to suggest, then, is that there are many routes to self-realization and that different cultures give priority to different routes. And uh, the French have emphasized artistic achievement, and we should be grateful for that. The French have emphasized a variety of other things. I know that mastering the art of French cooking is a book that has sold widely in the United States. I can promise you, despite the excellent meal we've had this evening, that Mastering the Art of American Cooking is not a book that would sell very widely in <laughs> France. <laughs> Americans have achieved self-realization through improved business processes. Americans like the Scots, as a matter of fact, have achieved self-realization through mechanical innovation. So not only are there many routes to self-realization, but the economy and society we have and the variety of factors that make up our lives are dependent on people having chosen this great range of, uh, of routes to self-realization. And these routes are not really appropriable. Even in France, you can buy Apple products. In Paris, they even have an Apple store, which looks very like the Apple stores there are everywhere else. You have the paintings of great French artists here in New York in every bit as much profusion as we find them in Paris. These kind of achievements are not appropriable 
in economist language. And the pluralism I'm describing is fundamental to how uh, modern economic systems work. You'll all know the remark with which Tolstoy begins, Anna Makarinina, where, where he says, uh, all happy families are similar, unhappy families are all unhappy in different ways. I've always thought that that remark should be precisely reversed when applied to the world of business finance, that unsuccessful people and businesses are unsuccessful in much the same way. The thing that makes individuals and, and businesses successful is that they are successful in different ways. But there's a problem that several contributors in the course of the last day and a half have pointed out, <laughs> which is that it is not open to most of us to achieve self-realization in the style of Matisse or Hemingway or Jobs or Ned Phelps. Most people don't achieve that kind of self-realization. Most people, in fact, don't achieve self-realization through work. Frankly, being on a checkout at Walmart is not very conducive to self-realization. The people who do these kind of things can achieve self-realization, but they typically achieve self-realization in other ways, frequently in non-economic ways, through their family, their friends, their leisure activities of various kinds. And for these people, the work they do is essentially instrumental. And the example of the checkout assistant at Walmart is one I've chosen deliberately, not just because Walmart is the largest employer in America and indeed the largest employer in the world, but also because Walmart has been a significant contributor to US economic growth over the last two decades increased productivity in retail and wholesale distribution is, according to the calculations of the people who do growth accounting exercise, an important part of America's economic progress. And Walmart has also <coughs> enhanced the performance of the American economy by improving America's trade, through terms of trade, through their aggressive buying. But frankly, if, if being on the checkout at Walmart <coughs> isn't a route to self-realization, shopping at Walmart isn't really a route to self-realization either. I, I go shopping in France. The butcher, the grocer, the greengrocer, the fishmonger I, I use, they know my name. They talk to me about, uh, about the produce they have. And it's a very long time since that kind of experience has been readily available in, uh, in Britain or the United States. And we don't take account of that thing, that observation, in the way we actually account for these sorts of activities. The price of retailing is generally the retail margin per dollar of sales. And that means that Walmart have increased productivity by driving the price of retailing down, whereas the municipal market in Montauk definitely has not. But the municipal market in Montauk is a joy to shop in. The Walmart store, only one, I have to confess in my life that I've been in, undoubtedly was not a joy in that kind of sense. And what I'm saying now, in terms of the way we do this accounting, links what I'm saying this evening to what Joe Stieglitz had to say to us tonight. And I want to end what I'm saying this evening with three French paradoxes. There's what is very widely known as the French paradox, which starts with the observation that the French diet is heavy with red meat, with fats, with excellent wines. And yet, obesity is not particularly high in France. And France actually has, after Japan, the longest life expectancy in, among developed countries. At 82, it's about four years above the level of, uh, 
of Britain and the United States. That's a very familiar paradox, and I'm not the person to explain what is going on there. I want to add to it two economic paradoxes. <coughs> and they're, I think, quite substantial. The first of my paradoxes is that since 1973, real gross domestic product, the measure we typically use of output in the United States, has risen steadily relative to the GDP of France by an average of about 1% a year, which means over that period it is about 50, it has risen in real terms about 50% relative to the GDP of France. That's one fact. The other fact is that since 1973, the median income in the United States has remained approximately constant in real terms. It's a fact astonishing to me that this will be the first generation of Americans which, taken as a whole, is not better off than the previous generation of Americans. So median income has remained constant, yet during that same period, the median real income in France has risen by 50%. These facts are, I think, totally extraordinary, or the conjunction of these facts are totally extraordinary. And uh, those of us who are economists in this room will know, actually, that uh, our modern macroeconomics relies heavily on what are so-called representative agent models. And I think if I were to ask what is the income of a representative agent, which is what we use in these models, the median real income would probably be what I would uh, use as that variable. It's not the variable we do use in what is the so-called calibration of these models, but it's certainly relevant to this. So what's the explanation of this paradox? Why is it uh, the, 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 the behavior of GDP and uh, of, uh, of uh, median income in the two countries is so divergent. The three elements in the explanation, one is population, that is the UK, US population has grown significantly faster than the French population. <coughs> if you look at GDP per head rather than GDP, that eliminates most of the difference between uh, US and French performance overall in GDP. The second factor is that the share of profits has increased very substantially in the United States and has increased only marginally in France. And the third and the largest element in the total is that inequality has increased very markedly in the United States and not in France. The top 10 percentile of the income distribution, their share in total earnings, in both countries it was about one third in the early 1970s. In the United States that figure has risen to what is now very close to 50%, while in France it is at the same level as it was in the 1970s, that is about a third. And it's these three elements taken together that provide the, the explanation of the divergent movement. The second French paradox, the divergence in the movements in the two countries of median income and of GDP. The third paradox then is that output per hour is much the same in the two countries. It's either slightly higher or slightly lower, depending on whether you use purchasing power parity or market exchange rates in making the adjustment. But for practical purposes, we can say that output per hour worked is much the same in the two countries. However, private consumption in the United States is 40% higher than in France. That's my last French paradox. And if one asks what the explanation of that is, the answer is it's a, an accumulation of factors, all of which point in the same direction. 
One Joe talked about last night, and the largest part of the explanation is working hours. Uh, people in France have on average five, week five weeks of holiday a year. People in the United States have on average a bit more than two. The working week is shorter in France than it is in the, in the United States. But the largest part is that participation in the labor force is considerably lower in France than it is in the United States. Now, that isn't a, that fewer women work in France. These numbers are much the same. It isn't actually that unemployment is higher in France. These numbers are also now about, now about much the same. The critical element in participation is actually age group. Fewer young people work in France, and many fewer old people work in France. In fact, in the age group 60 to 65, only one French person in six is working, whereas a majority of Americans in that age group are working. Actually, even over 70, one American in six is working, whereas virtually nobody in France is working. I used to have the joke that the only person in France who was still in employment over the age of 70 <laughs> was President Chirac. <laughs> and he was only still in the job because he would be tried for corruption if he weren't <laughs> President of France. He is, as you will know, no longer President of France and is being tried for corruption. <laughs> So I certainly don't want to say that everything in France is rosy. So the working hours are the largest part of the explanation. Secondary part of the explanation is that public expenditure is higher in France. And a third part of the explanation is that savings are actually much higher in France. Where does this leave us? We have these French economic paradoxes of the very different behavior of median income and uh, gross domestic product. We have the paradox of similar underlying productivity, yet very different overall consumption. The simple answer, I think, is that both countries are doing the kinds of things they want to do. And two themes of what have been developed over the last two days have been the themes of pluralism and incommensurability. And I want, in my, what I want to say in conclusion, to emphasize these two factors again. There are different concepts of what makes the good life. We find different concepts in different countries. There isn't commensurability between these. We have, as between the United States and France, essentially the same technological possibilities. These countries have made different choices. These choices have been made differently at both the individual level and the social level. And I think it's very likely that each of these two countries is performing better in terms of its own underlying values. <coughs> we might want to challenge these values. As a Brit, somewhere in between, I might want to challenge both of these values. But each uh, is performing in terms of their own values. We can only understand these economic developments by embedding our economic analysis in the social and political context that gives rise to them. And if this conference has made a contribution to that kind of understanding, and even just to a recognition that we have to achieve that kind of understanding, then I think the organizers will have performed for all of us a very great service. Thank you all very much. John, would you uh, accept a question or two? Sure. Question. Amar, is that your hand? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Speaking into the microphone. Maybe you should stand up. Uh, 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 so, 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 John, most of us do not have 
the luxury that you have of choosing which co country we live in. I mean, some of us do. Uh, so if, if, if uh, <coughs> Scotland is not to your t taste, you have the luxury of moving to France. And, uh, but if France is not to some French person's taste, they can't move some, somewhere else. And you were implicitly suggesting a relatively homogenous national preference. That this is the way, this is what Frenchmen, France prefers, this is what uh, the United people in America prefer. Uh, but there are quite considerable differences within each country. And should not a, a good society or a good economy permit within each country uh, a wide range of, of possibilities for, uh, and are, are, are we constructing an economic and social system where you either buy into the American way or you buy into the French way, and, and, and if you don't, then it's sort of bad on you as to, to construct an American phrase, to try, to try to uh, emigrate, or, or should we be looking for uh, social and economic uh, arrangements which will give ample choice to individuals about what, what kind of good life they wish to pursue? Yeah. I think that's a very important question, and it's an issue on which I would have liked to have said a lot more, because you are plainly right uh, that within countries there is clearly heterogeneity of preferences. Uh, I think if I go back to the Scottish story, one observation is that within a small country, you will have more homogeneity of preferences uh, than you will have in a very large country, like strikingly the United States, or equally like France or Britain, which by, by any standards are large countries. Now, that, but that doesn't drive me to say, as my many economists would be inclined to say, that all choices are made on the individual level, and only individual choices are valid. The truth is, firstly, that individual choices are very much formed by the social and political environment in which people are brought up uh, and in which they live. And as you correctly observe, not many people have as adults the choice of which of these environments they live in, although some do, and it's quite interesting to look at the choices that are made by the, the people who do have these choices. Uh, so. I'm in favor of pluralism within countries as I am between countries. But I think one also has to recognize that there is a range of choices that do have to be made at a social, a, at a social level. The kind of infrastructure you want has to be a collective choice rather than the aggregate of individual choices or rather we know that the, uh, the aggregate of individual choices is chaos and you don't have very much at all. Basically, the, the level of social security provision we have has to be made substantially as, an uh, as a collective choice. And I don't find it a satisfactory argument to say that is an argument against having social security and we therefore have to leave that as individual choices, and so on. That's what I wanted to say in saying that the, the pluralism which I described was the result of a mixture of differences in both individual choices and the social expression of an aggregation of individual choices. And I think that's the way we have to look at it. Very good. Another question, Mark Taylor. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your remarks. Whenever I read a text um, or consider problems, I'm always most intrigued by what is overlooked, what is not talked about. And uh, as, I've, as I've listened to the discussions the last day and a half, which have been enormously illuminating for me, uh, I have been struck by some of the things that haven't been talked about. Uh, I tried to sketch yesterday some of the uh, historical precedents for the notion of the individual subject uh, that underlies so much of Western uh, thinking, it uh, seems to me. 
The language of self-realization makes me very uneasy and the preoccupation with the notion of self-realization uh, because it seems to me often to entail a certain kind of understanding of the subject that is limited. What it seemed to be, one of the things that seemed to be missing in all of the discussion last day and a half of the good life of the good economy is the environmental context in which so much of this takes place. Um, Sasi touched on some of this when you talked about the extractive e economies, and, and uh, it was pretty appalling to me. But from my point of view, uh, the issue, these issues that are not being discussed politically are here of climate change, of environment, of issues like water, in terms of issues of justice and the like, are absolutely critical, not only to the good life, but to the good economy. Um, and subjects are embedded not only in social structures, but, in, social, but in, 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 in natural systems that have to be taken account of. So that self-realization, if we use that kind of language, can only occur in these kinds of natural systems as well that we also need to take account of, it seems to me, economically as well as uh, morally for all of this. I mean, I hope in what I have just said, I tried at least to broaden out the idea of self-realization, to emphasize the point that self-realization was something that occurred in a, in a particular context. I emphasize the social and political aspect of that context, but you're plainly right to want to add an environmental dimension to that as well. But all I can say to Ned and Richard is perhaps that's a subject for another conference. <laughs> <laughs> that's almost a perfect ending, I suppose. Maybe if there's one more burning question. Yes, the young lady in the back, in the balcony. <coughs> thank, <coughs> thank you. Excuse my voice. I'm a, a little under the weather. Um, it was a brilliant presentation and a, I think comparative analysis of uh, two cultures and two economic systems and two ways of, of organizing society and I think it was a really illuminating version of, of France having lived there myself for eight years. I guess my question is um, it, what is amazing and striking to me about France and the labor market is this adherence and loyalty to what we call atelier, the beauty of le métier, the work and the um, willingness to fight at any cost for the dignity of work in France. And how despite globalization, despite immigration, despite all of these sort of tumultuous things that could derail a society like France very easily, people will still put so much time and money and energy into the sanctity of specialized métiers, work. And I, and I think from that, we, we get the question of, of what in capitalism is economic democracy? And I think really in Paris and in France, my experience there has been the, the sort of assumption that, that economics <laughs> should, should work for democracy. And democracy is inextricable from economy. So I would like you to talk, if you could, just for a second about where, for example, the discussions in this conference have maybe not talked about that potentially white elephant in the room that we don't talk about in the United States, which is this lack of economic democracy around capitalism, which is really linked to the labor market and the value of work. Thanks. Um, I, think it, I think it's a very interesting question, and it gets at the what I would see is the ambivalence of a French attitude to work, which is there in two things which have been said, I think, quite rightly, correctly, about France and work. One, one thing that strikes me is the obsessive instrumentality of the French attitude to work. That is, I've talked about 
how early it is that French, fr French people retire. Uh, I find the fact that I could, certainly from a financial point of view, choose not to work and still do something that is incomprehensible to the vast majority of French people I, 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 I talk to, right? Well, well, one is trying to work to one's retreat, and it is inconceivable that one would not take the first conceivable opportunity uh, to exploit that. And the part of France where I live is one that is, has a great many French people, many of whom have been quite successful in their careers in Paris, who have now taken the opportunity to retire. And I, I've never heard anyone express regret at having done so, which is a sentiment I've often heard from people in Britain and the United States who have, uh, who have retired early. And yet, that, that instrumentality it does seem to be combined with a certain degree of, uh, as it were, pride in work of the kind you describe. That uh, being an assistant on one of these market stalls or in the small shops, the, the boutiques that are characteristic of a French uh, high street, is in that sense a much better job, in the sense that Richard Sennett would have described it, than being a checkout clerk on Walmart, even if in uh, unduly narrow economic terms, Walmart is, a, is an economic retailer, is a more economic retailer. That French tradespeople uh, characteristically seem to have a, a genuine pride and enthusiasm for the work they do. And yet, they are fundamentally instrumental about it. They are clear they are doing it uh, for the money and will stop doing it when there is, uh, not just when there's no longer money, but when they don't need to do it. And equally, uh, French public sector workers fight in ways that all of us are all too familiar with from reports of what is going on in France. They fight to grab their shares of the rents uh, that are, are generated from the strength of the French state. There are many French paradoxes, and we can only illuminate a few of them today. Well, John, thank you very, very much for a wonderful, wonderful talk.